Hello there, welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. This is episode number 185, coming at you live and direct from somewhere in East London. Maybe it's near Stratford, maybe it's near Maryland, maybe it's near Leighton, maybe it's near Leightonstone, but it's somewhere around there. I'll let you make your own mind up. How you doing? How you feeling, brothers and sisters? Hope you guys are well, man. Should I call you brothers and sisters? Oh, I can't actually do that, can I? Because I'll be copying James Charles. And everyone's going to think I'm a copycat. I'm not. Um, so I'm not going to call you brothers and sisters, but I'm going to call you friends, acquaintances, um, compadres, um, um, people that I have a connection with on the interwebs, over the internet, in some way or some capacity. Wherever you are, wherever you're doing, hope you're good, hope you're having a good day, good morning, whatever it may be. It's now, what, Friday morning for me? Um, as per usual, this mornings are usually a time for me to go and run around um some you know run on some concrete in a circle trying to beat my previous times today was no different this morning i did a 1000 meter repeat for four times around the block that i ran around and i um, averaged about uh between se a seven minute 50 and a six minute 20 mile which is very good in my estimation and it's taken me back to where i want to get to in terms of my half marathon training and if you're asking agostino what half marathon training i haven't heard about this well you're in luck i'm going to tell you all about it so a couple of weeks ago i decided i had this br i had this brilliant idea where i decided you know what i've been going out a bit too much um, I need to kind of get my life back in order. I need to kind of get a bit serious, get a little bit more focused on what I'm doing, whether it's the DJing, whether it's the podcasting, whether it's updating my blog, which I haven't done in fucking yonks, whether it's taking pictures, being creative, whatever I'm doing on the outside, right? Wherever I, wherever I do outside of work, I need to get more serious with it because I was letting my, you know, my leisurely life take the best of me. Um, so I decided to have a little goal in mind of running a half marathon and if you're asking me why i decided to run a half marathon because the half marathon coming up is one of the half marathons that's usually killed me over the years something that's kind of gave me a lot of um anxiety and made me afraid of of brighter days and shit and it's called the hackney half marathon and if you guys are from east or you're from london in general you probably have heard of this half marathon it's a half marathon that i think started a couple i think i'm gonna say it started maybe five years ago I'm, I'm pretty sure i ran the first one and it basically takes you through most of hackney um and then you end up you kind of start at hackney marshes and you end up at hackney marshes taking detours through you know homerton clapton all those nice little places dawson blah, blah 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 stratford and then you come back into hackney marshes it's a very brutal course um brutal in the in the fact that there's a couple of hills um it's fairly open there's no real tall buildings covering the roads that you're running on so the sun beats down on you when it's really hot and as you can see by the video or if you're listening via the audio you can tell that i'm in a really hot room right now because you know sometimes you can tell so it's not the most forgiving course in the world but the whole genesis or the whole the whole idea of the uh, the whole um um the whole um inspiration behind all this or you know what kind of game what, what do I inspiration the, <laughs> the reason why i decided to do this well because I, like i said i mentioned i was going i was going a bit i was going out too much i was in it's of indulging myself too much on the outside world and usually I found whenever I give myself a little target or a goal that I want to achieve, it usually uh, um, it usually provides me with the bumpers on either side or with the framework or with the kind of, you know, train tracks that I need to kind of follow. If I stop a couple of times or I veer off the tracks a little bit, it's okay because I'll just jump back on them. But it gives me some kind of guidance. So when I have a half marathon due that's coming up in four weeks it kind of tempers everything else and everything else has to kind of fall everything else has to take um the, the half marathon takes priority um over anything else that i'm doing it's a little bit crazy to do it because you know most of the training plans i've looked online and have, had a google they always kind of um encourage people to do a mac a minimum of of eight weeks and a maximum of 12 or 14 weeks of training before a marathon and uh, to you effectively have to do a whole week of tapering of not doing anything until you, you kind of race so i'm kind of doing this kind of the last minute but I, I hope it's not last minute because I think from the month of from the end of February until now I've been running consistently every single no every week basically I've run at least twice a week so it's not like I'm I'm coming into it with absolutely no experience but I've decided to go online I got some training plans I kind of um, mesh it together with the stuff I'm doing with the power speed and drones which is somewhere around here have I got it oh, somewhere else where I move, I move it yeah I moved it doesn't matter anyway I'm 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 putting some plans together. I'm melding it all in and I've got a plan here that I found online um, that I think I'm going to use and it's, I don't know I just found it randomly doing a Google 
Because again, with these things, sometimes you know people love to kind of waste time and go on Google and search, you know, for ages of for the perfect plan that's going to really work for them. Eventually, essentially, you're never going to know what's going to work for you until you try it. Just go out there and run. So I just went on Google, typed in a four week training plan. Most of them were, you know, were kind of saying the same sort of thing. Just try and get in as much mileage as possible before you start your race. Um, and that was basically what they were going around. Um, mostly they were telling me to lay off the weight, so I'm probably not going to go gym for the next four weeks. And just maybe maybe do kind of like push up sit ups and squats, air squats and stuff like that to keep myself um, uh, tight that way. But the plan that I got, I got online, which as you can see here from the phone, you can see a little bit of the. There's a way to bring the, the screen up on the on on here, isn't it? But I don't know how to do it. If I was smart enough, I would know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I'll just read it off here. So essentially, the plan that I'm doing is something that I found online, and it's made by a lady called Michelle Bastos Spears. I tried to Google it to find if it's a real person. I'm not sure if it is a real person. I think sometimes they just invent these uh, supposed um, trainers, trainers or, you know, health n nutritionists or athletes, personal trainers, just to invent their names and put a plan next to it. But whatever it is, what isn't it? I'm just going to use it anyway for the t time being. So essentially week one, it tells you to run uh, three miles on a Monday, four miles on a Wednesday, two miles on a Thursday, and then a big six mile on a, on a Saturday. Week two, the same thing. You've got three miles, five miles, two miles, eight miles. So essentially you're running four times a week. And then week three, you got the same thing again. And then, yeah, so you're never really running the full distance. I think week three, you run a 10 mile on the Saturday. That's a week before the race. And then on the week of the race, you just do three miles, four miles, two miles, and you rest for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then you run. So which, which would be quite good, actually. I'm actually looking forward to that. I think that's going to be very, very good. Um, Again, it's going to be very taxing on my body. Today, I did, um, like I did say, four, 400 meters. I did a 3.5 mile run yesterday. So tomorrow, I'm going to do my six mile run, um, the long run. I'll do that nice and easy. And then week two will be when it kind of starts to get ramped up. So it's going to be very difficult. It's not going to be the easiest thing I've done in the world. But I think I need this kind of like, you know, I need this um, I need this framework, this sort of constraints in order for me to kind of do my best work this year. Because again, like I mentioned in the other day, in the other podcast, like, you know, it's four months in already. The year's fucking flying away. By next week, the end of the month is already there. Then we're in May. You know, festival season pops up. Everyone starts doing their thing. Everyone starts, you know bemoaning the fact that they didn't work out enough during the summer they didn't get the summer body they wanted but i'm not even the summer body thing i just want to be healthy i think you know i'm always in the mind of like you know, especially in the summer it's good to be as light as you can in the winter you might want to bulk up and then you kind of do the same sort of thing i guess animals do sim something similar too right when they hibernate during the winter um but yeah that's, that, that was a plan so it was very very strenuous very tiring um i'm probably gonna start wearing shorts again this this time running out when i sometimes if, if i go out early i say i went out at 6 a.m it was a little bit brisky, but by the time I came back at about 7.10, it was already starting to get a little bit warm. So I felt a bit ridiculous in my rain jacket and my long trousers and shit and my long tracksuit pants, whatever. So I think next time around, it's probably best to do the shorts. Anyways, let's move on. Got so much topics to talk about. Loads of tabs of stuff that I've seen on the internet that I want to rummage through and talk to you love people about some news i want to share some news you're interested in some news you might not be interested in but that's the whole beauty of a podcast not everything is going to be stuff that you want to hear but some of it might be stuff that you want to hear and it's going to be worth it because at the end of the day it's free let's go um number one here is this interesting topic from writers um exclusive behind airbnb's uh bet on show business to hook travelers really interesting article here right so um i saw this the other day and it's essentially telling us that airbnb are getting into the tv production um scene they want to produce their own tv show with the hope of that will inspire travelers or people who want to travel to take up a trip with airbnb so Airbnb Inc, um, the article says from Reuters, I'll link in the show notes for you guys to read if you want to check it out. Um, Airbnb Inc, the high-flying startup for booking home rentals around the world, has ambitious has ambition to develop a slate of original shows to whet customers' appetite. I don't, know, I don't know how you spell wet that way if you're going to say that. I thought it was just wet normally. Okay, fair enough. Uh, for travel, four people familiar with the matter told Reuters. The strategy, previously unreported, is uh, is crucial for the company, which is privately valued at $31 billion. Mamma mia. And is gearing up for an initial public offering on a stock expected next year. Airbnb must distinguish itself from Bookings.com, Expedia, and others in the fiercely competitive and consolidated travel industry where apartment renting services are increasingly common. But come on, man. No one is no one no one in their right mind is comparing bookings.com and Expedia to fucking Airbnb, right? 
Do people actually book apartments or um, places to stay on Bookings.com and Expedia? I don't. I don't think I've ever used it for that. When I go on Bookings.com or Expedia, I go specifically to buy uh, to book a hotel room because there's some. There are even even though um, I don't think uh, I think it's strange, isn't it? Because I think um, even for all the drama of Uber, all the regulation drama and the stuff with Travis. Uh, Kalanick, the the OG founder that was kind of ousted from his own company, the beef they had with London, um, just in general, the, the overall drama with Uber. Uber probably done a better way of penetrating um, most regions around the world or most places around the world. I think most of you got even in the far flung places in Southeast Asia, your your Uber is gonna work. It's still gonna be the same taxi service you see running around the street, but it's gonna work if you want to use it. Whereas it seems to me like. Airbnb, there's still some um, Airbnb dead zones, like some holidays you go to, you just don't find any Airbnbs at all. I can't remember the place exactly. I think it might be Manchester or something similar to that. There weren't that as many Airbnbs as I thought there would be. There were a couple, but not as many as you'd assume, right? Because if you've been to Manchester, you know, it's like, you know, there's some beautiful apartments in the city centre and stuff. So you'd find them and then you'd find some other random places just on the outskirts, but there wasn't as many as I thought there would be. Um, there's always this kind of, I think Bristol's maybe the same sort of thing too. There's always these little dead zones, but sometimes you just have to book a hotel because there's no other place you want to go. And um, I guess because I'm so used to going to Berlin, going to Madrid, going to Barcelona, and these places using Airbnb, sometimes staying in a hotel um, is nice. You know, the idea that you wake up in the morning, you come back, you wake up in the morning, you go out the whole day and you have do your little travels, eat, do your sightseeing, and you come back to your room and it's already been, you know, it's been cleaned, the bed sheets have been changed. Like there's something, you know, something nice about if you someone taking care of that all the time, the annoying bit of it is like, you know, you have to go out and get breakfast every day because when you're in Airbnb, the nice thing about it is like, you just, you know, you just buy a couple of eggs and just have them in the morning and then, you know, you don't need to eat again until later on in the in evening or the afternoon. You'd have to think about where you will have to go and serve a breakfast. That's always kind of the annoying part of it, but I don't know. Anyway, it continues. Chief Executive Brian Chesky is driving the idea. Three of the people said, arguing that creative content is important for Airbnb's brand, even if the business case is not always clear. Brian wants to, yeah, well, this is very true. I've Trust me, I've been there in marketing teams where you're trying to justify a marketing initiative that might not be good for the overall bottom dollar because, you know, it's quite hard to quantify these kind of things, right? Because, I don't know, if this show ends up, um, you know, ends up attracting 1 million users. It doesn't necessarily mean that would equate to 1 million people booking uh, trips on Airbnb. What you want is that you want people to associate Airbnb with Wanderlust, right? You want them to associate Airbnb with, you know, this idea of traveling the world and to these far flung places and maybe and maybe picking your destination based on the places that you want to stay in instead of the other way around, right? Sometimes people just only book their holidays based on what's the cheapest flights, what's available, blah, blah, blah. Maybe they're going to be able to reverse it and say, look, Look at this amazing place that we've got in the middle of I don't know Tibet, whatever it may be. Look at the look at the sights and scenes around it because they've got those tours that they do, and this is you know, and then you can start planning your trip that way around. So in terms of associating yourself with that kind of image, it doesn't necessarily equate to the bottom dollar. And when you're talking to the, the people that have their fingers on the wallet or the card or you know have the have the the code for the bank account and shit and for the wire payments, they probably don't get it in some regards. But you know. That's the fight that I, I kind of always kind of like in meetings and stuff as well, trying to justify those kind of things because they come from a good place too. You just have to kind of make them see um, see it your way and you can kind of see it their way. Anyway, it continues. Um, Brian wants to create a studio. Awesome. One of the people said, uh, the mentality, let's do shows, let's do films because we want to be travel everything, which is very true. Chesky, who founded the company, likes big splashy things, another person said. Uh, for the last three years, Airbnb have battled around, uh, battled around the idea of creating or licensing multi mini series and documentaries about travel and shows featuring Airbnb homes, guests, and house and host. One of the people said it was discussed working with studios as well as starting its own, which is very true because they did that thing recently with Berlin, right? Do you remember that? Do you see that article? There was an article recently about um, people in Berlin getting annoyed that um, some, there's an Airbnb tour, I think, at the moment now about. Um, something about uh, tr connect with the the Berlin underground electronic scene or something and they take you to all the like you know the um, well-known Berlin spots whether it's record stores whether it's old warehouse spaces that aren't used anymore whether it's now defunct clubs whether it is actual clubs whether it's um, agencies whether it's I don't know a park bench where a certain producer met somebody else I mean they take them all to all the legendary Berlin techno spots that you'd kind of know if you're in part of the scene they'd kind of do it in the Airbnb tour and I think a lot of people in the scene will kind of get annoyed by it because you know, it's a little bit cheesy, it's a little bit corny. And I guess if you're part of the scene and you're an OG, it's a little bit, you know, it's just a little bit 
naff. But I see, I, I see the vision and I get, because I know a lot of people make quite a lot of money from it. I, I think I mentioned, I've watched, I heard somebody on the podcast mention how they made a lot of money from doing those tours on Airbnb, right? Like the kind, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a step up from the Jack the Ripper shit you see in Brick Lane in London. Um, essentially somebody taking you to Shoreditch, to Brick Lane, to all the b- best spots in Dawson. I'm sure there must be, it's a bit different now because most of the, the clubs on the strip are fucking closed, but when the strip in Dawson was popping off, that would have been an awesome tour to have on Airbnb, right? Take somebody from Jaguar Shoes all the way up, like to Haggerston, if they're still alive, take them down to um, to birthdays and then go back down to Alibi, do you know what I mean? And then when you come out of that, maybe go back up to Mustache Bar until six, do you know what I mean? That would be fucking awesome to do, but I guess, you know, nowadays with, with the strip being now, you know, defunct and full of fucking commercial units, it's probably not going to happen. Um, it continues, the company has worked on a television show slated for Apple Inc.'s, a- Apple's up-and-coming streaming service, Home, a docuseries featuring unique um, abodes around the world and the people behind them. One executive producer of the show is Joe Poland, a company vice president who ran luxury retreats when they would be acquired the booking site in 2017. Airbnb announced last week it had developed a pro- and produced a documentary, Gay Chorus uh, Deep South, which follows the San Francisco gay men's choir on a tour across South United States and on premiere the Tribeca Film Festival next week. Um, Airbnb told Reuters it's providing it's provided funding for the project. In an interview, Airbnb's top policy and communication uh, executive Chris Lehane said the company is considering streaming films and shows through the app. Oh, awesome! As well as through other video platforms, that's gonna be cool, man. You see how how honestly the vision. Some of these guys, man, that, there's a reason why these guys are who they are, and they start these companies and they end up, you know. Um, uh, putting their, you know, having their company listed um, and stuff like that, wherever it may be, and, you know, IPOs and exiting with big amounts of big ones of cash in their back pockets. It's because they have this really grandiose, almost far flung, almost, you know, um, ridiculous ideas behind their brand. You know, who would have guessed it back in the day when I used to book my shitty apartments um, in Neuklund in Berlin to go and get fucked up and in Berlin for a weekend? Who would have guessed that this, this same app? would now evolve into an app that invites people to take tours in different places and to see different sites, especially if they're traveling solo, which I'm sure Airbnb has a lot of, I'm sure Airbnb has a lot of data about the people that travel using Airbnb. Cause I know a lot of people like myself who don't necessarily, you know, I don't mind going to a hostel. I don't mind being around some young kids and chilling out or whatever it may be, but I'm also at that kind of age and that kind of place in my life where I kind of want my own space. Right. I want to get, you know, I want to just wake up and do my own shit. I don't want to wake up when 70, you know, six six other 21 year olds who are full of life are waking up and deciding to go out and shit i want to wake up whenever i want to wake up and sometimes you know it helps us on the best place for it so i know a lot of people maybe at my in my age who kind of you know like to have that kind of you know loose experience but also don't want to be in a hotel a bit sterile but also don't necessarily always have the luxury of having to travel with friends you know sometimes you don't have that you don't have a good social group of friends who are able at drop of a hat to go to where you want to go to or maybe you just don't have the friends in general but you still want to go, right? I went, yeah, like like when I went to Bergheim recently to see um, DJ Harvey um, for that weekend in Berlin, I specifically went on my own because I knew no one else would want to go, right? It was a random thing, but Harvey playing in Bergheim. I'm not sure if anyone else would care. Well, should I make them care? I want to go myself. The Bergheim is always a great place to go on your own anyway. So I went. So I'm sure Airbnb has a lot of uh, data about the amount of people that go, that use Airbnb and that travel solo. So I think a lot of this has to look has to do with that person and also the other kind of people who are, you know, the the person that comes along that's not too sure about it. They're gonna see that show and go, Oh yeah, shit, this is what my friend's always talking about, isn't it? Oh, this looks awesome. And then kind of go from that way. And of course, couples as well, kind of, you know, you love Airbnb because you get to stay in, you know, a person's amazing home and you get to kind of, you know, tap out for a week or so with your partner and hang out. But yeah, that look that's, that, that seems fucking awesome. I'm a big fan of it. Um I'm hoping we'll see more of it. I'm interested to see how they develop the actual app. And how they kind of use that. Um, let me see if I can get that story up from Airbnb, uh, Tours, Berlin, Resident Advisor. Let's see if I can get it. And I'll read this to you quickly too before we move on. There's a really cool article I saw about it. Yeah, so here we go. Um, this is an article that I saw that I thought was interesting. <laughs> Berlin promoters are fucking hating it so much. So this is an article from Resident Advisor kind of going off from what we spoke about earlier. So, um, version advisor headline says we're we're a stop on a ridiculous human safari. Berlin promoters respond to Airbnb's club tours. Uh, here we go. Um, this is from Fifth of April, but again, I'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out for yourselves. Uh, here we go. 
Uh, two Berlin clubs allegedly visited by the Berlin Affiliated Experience Tour, that's what they're called, of the city's electronic music scene, have spoken to Resident Advisor. Airbnb is offering multiple Berlin experiences, but they do this everywhere. It's, all, it's When you go on the website, you can see they've got experiences, they've got homes, they've got tours. It's all on there, right? And like I said before, I'm, I've heard loads of people, loads of kind of creative entrepreneurs using that service and kind of... And kind of um, so using a service in order to kind of promote the club culture or the you know whatever culture is going on around this in a city and kind of being a go-to person they kind of you get, i think you get a percentage or whatever people pay for it from the airbnb i'm not sure how much percentage they take maybe 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 five percent airbnb taking to keep the rest i'm not too sure but anyway it continues um uh, the tours in question called club like a local berlin underground and discover the city's techno club scene are just two of many offered through airbnb experiences which provides personalized tours workshop and other activities hosted by local guides other experiences in berlin include river cruises street art tours and google cache reveals a unavailable and now unavailable new york club experience awesome right the club tours prom promise to prepare guests for a night of dance music before bringing them to a club usually it, and again this isn't really that um that um um far flung because if you've ever used uh, again if you're a solo traveler like myself and you use a website called meetup.com you'll know that they have a lot of uh, meetups on that website that you can effectively go and you know hang out with people that are also traveling solo or people that are in the in the that live in the city and, and they're and they're alone they want to meet new people and expand their social group whatever it may be but they also have the ability to kind of go to specific things so if you're into comedy they might put on a comedy night they'll might there might be a comedy night that they specifically uh partner with the club promoter with or the promoter that's putting it on and they would i don't know they, they might work out a deal where the people from meetup get in for a discounted price or you get in and you get a free drink or whatever it may be right and i remember i went to one where we did we did like a bar crawl i think it was in barcelona when i did my half marathon that was really good you went, went to different bars and again they had different they had different deals then on that day and i think it was a random i think it was like a really early time in the day so let's say that let's say 3 p.m or 5 p.m when there's not that many people in the bar so for the for the bar for the bar owners themselves it's good for them because you know they get to sell some drinks it gets to be a bit busy you know usually bars um rely a lot on the optics of like how it looks on the inside because people sometimes walk by and think oh it looks cool and they want to pop in Blah, 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 blah. So this thing has been happening for a while, but Berlin have kind of, I mean, Airbnb have kind of like taken it a step further by really tapping into the kind of uh, millennial market and, and providing tours that are really, really hyper specific, like again, with the, with the Berlin electronic music scene. Anyways, continues. According to reviews left on Airbnb, guests meet guides at a bar or in some cases a guide's house for a briefing, which is awesome. The guides also help guests select clothes that will improve their chances of entry. I don't think that's anything bad. Could people do it anywhere on Google? You can just go on Google now and find out, oh, how do I get into Berlin? How do I get to Bergheim? How do I get to Panama Bar? And it'll tell you, like, and people will run through it. And it's good because at the end of the day, most of these, even on Reddit, the the subreddit techno, right? Go on it. It's fucking awesome. Great, great subreddit. I think it's reddit.com forward slash r forward slash techno. Really, really cool subreddit. And there's those people on there that live in Berlin who will tell you, who will kind of write, really be super blunt about how you should act and how you should carry yourself in Berlin clubs. And, you know, the whole a law or mystery behind Bergheim has kind of seeped through to other clubs anyway. Everyone does, everyone selects at doors, everyone selects um, at the door in Berlin for the most part. They don't, like, you know, you can't buy a ticket in advance. If, if, if they don't like your vibe, you don't get in. You just have places you can go into, but that kind of um, high bar of entry it allows people to be more, it, allows, it, it encourages people to be on their best behavior. And if you go on Google and you type in how to get into a Berlin club, the thing you'll find most likely is locals or people that have been there previously telling you, hey, be on your best behavior. Don't be too drunk. Don't be too high. Don't be a new, whatever it may be. There's things that people will say to you on, on, on online or you'll see read online that are kind of, you know, great tips and tricks. And if they tell you, oh, wear a certain dress or be aware that the club you're going to is like a gay sex club, um, you might not, you know, if you wear a certain item of clothing, they might not like you. Or if you're not that, if you're not that way inclined, probably don't go there because you're not gonna make people feel comfortable. It's all good things, I guess, isn't it? It's not. I, I don't see anything that's anything bad about it. Um, and also at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's increasing people's chances to get in. One guide even offers to teach dance moves. Wow, drinks and entry. Okay, drinks and entry to the clubs are not included in the tour prices, which can cost more than seventy euros for four hours. Again, I don't think that's too bad. It's a, it's a well, it's a good investment. If you're going to, if you're again, I'm a solo traveler, but I go on my own, and I'm very, I'm I'm aware of the scene. 
I've been in the scene for a while. I know the music. I know the people in the scene. I'm aware of the promoters, the club nights, the bars and stuff. I'm very, I, I am, I have all the information needed in order to kind of not make a fool of myself when I go to these places. But if you're somebody that's kind of just got into this and you've kind of been close to your first big electronic music acts like Dax J or something like that, a festival you went to randomly and all of a sudden you're digging in deep and you're finding out who God the answer is, you're finding out who Nina, uh, Nina Kravitz is, you're kind of just going through like, wow, 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 wow. You, it's, it's quite good that someone's providing you with this service that's teaching you all these things. But, you know, somebody telling you how to do um, a dance move in fucking um, Berlin and stuff is really funny because it reminds me of this uh, video that I saw ages ago, right? Of this young lady. I hope I can find it here. There's this great video I saw of this girl dancing to techno in her bedroom. Let me see if I can find it. It was really good because it was fucking awesome. Techno dance moves. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, there was a girl doing it, not 2019. This is a really stupid one, but there was a girl that I found that I thought was awesome. Oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, I got it. 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 So I remember finding this. Oh, it's only 10 months ago. Okay, fair enough. Maybe I thought it was, it was sooner than that. But yeah, there's this great girl. There's this girl that's got this amazing video. Again, I'll link in the show notes so you don't have to pay, you know, 70 for euros or someone teaches you how to dance. That teaches you how to dance techno and it's fucking banging, right? I'll get up here on the screen. Let me let me hide this for a moment there. So this one is called How to Dance Techno. Right? And it's by and it's by a girl called Mitara Boy. But I'll I'll link it in the show notes for you guys to check out. Um on the screen here it says some dance moves or all dance moves um seem weird for those who never who were never in techno parties but really the most of them also me are dancing like this and we love it so please don't laugh at people dancing like this just let them enjoy and feel the music of course man here we go here she is right it's fucking awesome check this out simple steps side to side classic test the shoulders of course oh love it love it Side to side. Yeah. She, and she's got a great outfit on too, by the way. Like, ripped jeans with the sleeve, on the knee, sorry. Wallet chain, a bra, knit top, double set. Awesome. Yeah. I want to go to techno party now. Swing your hips. Of course. Yeah. Woo. Step and use your butt. I like that one. Step hard and hands up. It's a really cool video. I recommend you check it out. Push away. But anyway, that, that's basically the main premise of the, of the video. I won't, I won't bore you with all of it. Um, but I'll link in the show notes. But anyway, let's get back to this article. I keep getting distracted. Um, so basically, this article back on Resident Advisor. Um, According to the reviews left on the Airbnb, the tours visit some of the Berlin's best known venues, including Grace Muller, which is fucking awesome Kit Kat club which i haven't been to actually i don't think i've been to Kit Kat club since i've been there grishmi is fucking one of my favorite places to go to it's the original for me it's uh, the home of the club kid you're gonna find all the some of the best outfits i've ever seen in my life i've been in greece Muller. like fucking awesome and obviously it's a great site as well it's a really sprawling place you can hang out where all the mat is it water tank or whatever it's called there there's a massive like jungle gym sort of contraption thing on the outside you can sit on the lake and look out and mong out on the river and shit um super cool um anyway it continues Grish Muller, a sprawling club in a former nuclear grain mill, recently hosted DJs such as Rod Hard, Ellen Alien, and Intergalactic Gallery. Sorry, Intergalactic Gary. While Kick Hat Club is co-ed fetish spot, it's home of the popular techno party Gagan. Paul Temple enjoyed playing there so much it inspired one of his best known tracks. Our work is to create a safe, playful environment where people can have fun and be themselves with no one to judge them. Uh, Gregan promoter told RA. It hurts me that to hear that we became a spot on a ridiculous human safari for people who think that they can buy anything without having any idea about what's going on inside a club or how too much it works. But that's not really that, that's not fair. I understand what he means. I get it. If you're a club and you've been put on this list, it may be it does feel a bit cheapening. You can feel a bit like, ugh, this is a bit yucky, right? I get it if you're the club promoter, the club owner. But I think we have to be um as much, I think we, we do quite well as a as as fans of techno and as um, real supporters of the scene, and we buy the records and we go to club nights, we buy drinks, um, we attend lectures. We 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 are really we are a good community, right? We put our money where our mouth is, and we support the people that we love. But I also think we're really good at also making sure that we police our own. For the most part, like even in clubs in London, I've seen quite a real, I've seen a real big increase in people just being sensible in the club, on the dance floor. I've seen people helping people out, even if they're girls and not being creepy about it, helping them out with water, making them okay, um, making sure they can, if they want to sit down. 
Um, just generally being a good sport and policing people. And if there's their shitheads in there, like telling the bouncers to get them out. Just really good people in the sport. I've, I've seen it overall. I've seen that abundance. But I think there also needs to be an understanding that we all don't come into the scene via the same way, right? We all don't come into it being hyper nerdy geeks, uh, looking at random tracks on on Discogs or searching for clubs on YouTube that you've heard about and then looking at videos of these grainy, horrible videos filmed in a fucking potato and then maybe booking a flight there, going there randomly and checking it out like I did with, with fucking Robert Johnson. I read this article about Robert Johnson, resident advisor. It got me inspired. Um, I randomly booked a flight to go to Frankfurt and end up going there and going to see Ricardo Velo Lobos one weekend, right? Not everyone does that. Some people come into electronic music, like I said before, like, you know, because they went to go, they went to Coachella, for instance, and they saw a hyper commercial uh, DJ set from one of the best known electronic artists who's maybe kind of progressed into the mainstream. And then that maybe got them a bit interested. And then they saw a collaborator that, that that person did a track with. And then that made them dig a bit more deeper. And then they found out about the Bergheim for an article on The Guardian or one of these working broadsheets. And that got them interested. And they don't really have much of a, have much of a knowledge base but they're interested. They want to come along. I, I don't think you should tell them, no, you need to study more. You need to be outside more in order to kind of come in. But let them come in, right? Let them see what it's about. I think some, I think sometimes the best experience, especially electronic music wise, is maybe going to Berlin and just getting known everywhere, right? Nine, 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 nine. Not tonight, not tonight, not tonight. Everywhere you go. That might be a good ed- education because just standing in the queue, just being around the stuff, just being outside the club, hearing the music, seeing the vibe, seeing how calm everyone is, seeing how chill everything is, seeing how professional, the, it, seeing how the love, seeing people come up to bouncers that they've known all, like, I don't know, for 10 years and they become to the same place every Saturday, giving them a big hug and walking in. That kind of appreciation, will that will give you a big understanding of the scene just by getting the nose all over the place. And I think sometimes even going to things like this, it's, I think when you're a fan and you go to, and you book a tour with, uh, a, a discovery tour on Airbnb and you get there and you discover how naff it is, you'll quickly know where what you should and shouldn't be doing, right? You'll figure out, you'll be like, ah, oh, this is super naff. The people that you're around, because I'm sure the people that are going on these tours aren't the most well-educated in the scene, right? But they have an interest. And if you really want to develop your interest, you'll go to this thing first and then you'll kind of, you know, it'll be your first step in. So I think if you're the promoter and you're a club owner, I get it. It's a bit naff. It's a bit disgusting. It's a bit yucky. But I think for the person on the outside who's kind of, discovered electronic music festival because they went to see somebody because they went to go see some i don't know they got to they went to go see martin garrick gertrix or something like that at tomorrowland and then by chance because they're waiting for that guy to play they happen to you know stumble across i don't know charlotte the wit or somebody else in less london that and that got them interested in techno i think it's quite a good thing to get them involved in and i get it if you're the club owner it's annoying but i don't know give people a chance man uh Human Safari, you think that they can come and buy anything by having an idea or how much? It doesn't mean it's not, they're not really buying. Because again, you pay for the discovery tour, but it still doesn't guarantee your entry. I don't think any of these promoters, again, if you're doing if you're doing a discovery tour and you're the tour um, provider, tour operator, you can't really provide an authentic Berlin or electronic music scene experience without getting, without, you can't do it by trying to go to a club and arrange for them to give you preferential treatment to get in. It's not going to happen because the place that you want to go to to have that happen will, will straight away say, no, get the fuck out of here. So you're going to have to make it, you have to, it's going to be, it's going to be real. You got to be like, hey, you're giving me your money so I can brief you. I can give you some idea on the music. If you meet me at my house, I can play some records. We can maybe watch a couple of clips. I can watch a couple of interviews. I can show you some magazines. I can show you some merch, some things I got, some flyers from previous parties, whatever it may be. I can give you my education, right? Because we've all, we all, I sometimes think we take, I, we take our experience for granted. Like I know for sure in my like humble abode, I've probably got tons of experience, tons of materials I can give somebody that can really give them an insight on what, uh, um, the Berlin experience is all about, right? Um, you pre- should probably just probably just li- watch. Um, don't forget to go to sleep. That legendary uh, Berlin club scene documentary from back in the day. That's probably the best education you want to get. But the person just say, hey, I'm gonna you're gonna I'm gonna take your seventy euros, but I'm gonna give you education. We're gonna go to all these nice record stores. We're gonna get maybe get a beer, hang out, sit around, like you know, have that what's that tea that everyone drinks in Berlin and shit. Um, we're going to chill out, but then I can't guarantee you entry with these places. We're going to go to a couple of places. Some of you will get in, some of you won't. I've got a list of places that I want to get to. If you don't get into there, don't worry. It's Berlin. There's loads of clubs. And we're going to try We're just going to get down and listen and see what we get into. But, you know, it's going to be the experience. I think that's cool. You know, because it's, you know, it's impossible they can go to Kit Kat, Grease Muller, Panorama Bar, all these kind of places and try and get a deal. They're not going to tell them. They're not going to tell them to jump off a cliff, innit? Anyway, it, it, it continues. As a former history student, I think it's great to offer insights of Berlin history and club talk and club 
culture for tourists. Um, Johan Wecourt Booker at Griezmann said, but the way it's advertised on Airbnb is ridiculous. Mostly foreigners who moved to the city in the last few years offering a bit. Ber- oh, okay. That's what he's for. Okay. Mostly foreign. So, so I guess for the people that live in, for the people that live in Berlin or who are original Berliners, they get annoyed because it's foreigners that are actually doing these tours who don't know that much about the scene anyway. We're not really plugged in. I get it in that respect. Fair enough. That makes sense. Mostly foreigners who moved to the city in the last few years uh, by charging eight euros for a chit chat in a bar, then sending people to random clubs. <laughs> we continue. I think it can be quite a scam if people pay up to eight euros only to have a one on one to hour lecture at a bar and then get sent to a club to have their own experience. People should definitely be able to learn about Berlin's club scenes, but paying this much only for advice instead of just going to discover a venue party by themselves misses out on the personal experience. Uh, again, not really, man. I don't agree. I don't think everyone's the same. We're not all built the same, man. I don't think. There's a huge swath of people out there who would want to go to Bergheim and Panorama, but just don't have the guts, man. They've heard of the horror stories. And again, like, think about it from uh, an average Joe's point of view, right? Most people, for the most part, if they have the money to go somewhere, they can go. Whether it's a shop, whether it's a cinema, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a bar. If you want a drink, you can go to this bar, you can get in and you can have a drink. For the most part, the only time you're, any, the only time you're, never, the only time you're not going to get in is if they, I don't know, they um they uh they're they're being a bit picky with the id and shit right oh you don't have your id you can't get in cool but for the most part if you have money you can go to most places so to cut so to come to a place like berlin and to suddenly be inundated with these responses that you can't come in because you just don't like your vibe it really fucks with your head right it doesn't really you don't really compute it properly oh it doesn't make sense but i want to come into a bar i want to come to the club like i want to spend money here but we don't care about your money you're not going to come in so it takes time to really understand where that's coming from and to appreciate what it's about. But sometimes people just don't want to go through that embarrassment of queuing up that long in a bar in outside of a nightclub and then being told you can't come in because you're not the particular, you don't look like the people that are in there, right? Um, that's a bit annoying and it can kind of feel a little bit, you know, hard to kind of get, um, to kind of figure out and to kind of hate that response for somebody. But for somebody to kind of, you know, take a time out of their day to meet at a bar, give you a lecture about the scene, give you some experience. Again, it's stuff that you won't know and, and, until you speak to a clubber, speak to somebody that actually goes out. And they might be, you might be the only person that they've actually spoken to that is actually from the scene. Because again, how are you going to meet these people if you don't go out anyway? So you make the, you take, you, you have the guts in general to kind of book a tour, which is a big thing. And then you get to the thing and someone's telling you you can't because it's, a, I don't know, man. I see it from both ends. I just see it from both ends. Anyway, it continues. The tour disagrees with the statement. It says, we are trying to help people fight against the corporate gentrification by inspiring more people to move here. Exactly. Agent one, the club guys, club like a local said, the burn underground, being able to pay the bills from doing what we are passionate about enables us to invest more time in positivity. Of course. Because again, they're sending them to all the cool places. They're not sending them to naff places. They're not trying to get deals. They're, 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 and again, I'm pretty sure they, when they meet them for a chit chat in a bar pre, prior for the lecture, they told them quite specifically, hey, you're not going to get in, right? Most of these places. But just go there with an open mind, open heart, and try and just like absorb everything around you and see what it's all about. And then from there, we'll go. Like, And again, the dress thing is very important. It's not something we, I don't think of. I always think about when I go. Um, the attitude is very important. I mean, I mean, like, I've never been more sober when I go to a club than I, when I'm in Berlin. Never in my life. Here in London, like, most places, like, you pre-drink at home, you pre-drink on the way there, you pre-drink on the train, like, fucking dying Abbott. You're always on it. But then in Berlin, there's a most, it's a most, it's a place I'm, I'm the, probably the most sober. I come back with hardly a hangover when, I, when I'm in Berlin because of the idea that you're going there to experience this club culture, to have an appreciation for the music, to show love to a DJ, to be a good uh, a f- good fellow clubber, to your, a good fellow club mate to all the other clubbers that you're in the club with. Um, Asian and Australian DJ moved to Berlin three years ago, runs the tours in with Martin, a 20th, a 28th century German who has lived in Berlin 14 years. Both had a fairly successful white-collar career before la- laundering Launching their tours, they declined to provide Ari with any names of the clubs they've visited on tour. We work very hard on making sure everybody is going to the, be a positive contribution to the party. We, we have no problems with rejecting and refunding those who don't. For good, we also place specific emphasis on helping our guests without the choice. This, of course, helps with entry, but more specifically, I find it very important in making both the guests and clubbers feel comfortable. Of course, based on our guests so far, we have noticed that solo travelers, especially females and couples, uh, enjoy having a safe family. This is what I'm talking about. Again, Let's take away myself, right? And that's a specific line there. Based on our get on our guest so far, we have noti- noticed that solo travelers, especially females and couples older than thirty, particularly enjoy having a safe, friendly crew to go out with. And that's some that's really important because I think 
most of these people that are objecting to it are like myself, right? We're quite independent. We can do our own thing. I go traveling and I go clubbing on my own regularly. I probably end up doing it this weekend. I do it most of the weekends. I love it. It's, it's a, one of my favorite things to do. Most of the reason because I don't really have people to go with, right? And I don't want to, and if you, I do want, I, ha, I do have to go with, I don't want to burden them with taking them to a place that they don't really want to go to because they want to be my friend. Cool. But there's some people out there who don't have that, you know, um, ability to do that. You know, if you're a couple in your 30s, but you want to have a good night out and get a bit monged out and go see a good DJ, but all your friends don't want to do it. How do you go to these places and feel comfortable? You want to go with a bit of a crew. You don't want to just hang out just together. You know, you're together all the time. You want to have a bit of experience, but you don't want to leave each other alone and go and explore the club. You want to just be together, but with a maybe a, a loose group of people. What better than go on a club tour, go to a few record stores, have the people um, bring some clothes with you, maybe, or whatever, or some outfits that you're thinking of wearing, have the guy kind of go through what he thinks will work and won't work, and then maybe try and, and see if it works out on a the, on the night out. I think that's fucking perfect. It's really, really good. I think it's a really good idea. I don't see anything wrong with it. And especially when it comes with girls. That's what I always think about a lot when I go out, because I think there must be a whole bevy of girls out there who are like me too, who have that ability, to, who have that really, who have that lust, that wanderlust to go out and go and travel and go and experience these club cultures but then they also have that unfortunate side of their brain that clicks on it's like oh i'm a girl i'm alone i can't go i can't go here i can't go there imagine going to a place like this super amazing i think it's really cool i'm a big fan of it man i think they're doing it the right way um anyway continues compared to the average night out in most of other places around the world clubbing in Berlin is an absolutely is absolutely a circus uh um that's why we love it and most beautiful and immersive freak show is always on the dance floor i agree rules of airbnb hosts in berlin are among the most restrictive in the world many residents blame the rental service for rising rent prices a sentiment reflected in the rules imposed by a local government which requires some landlords to obtain a permit before the use of this uh, the impact these clubs tours may have on the electric music scene isn't clear it's gonna be good it's gonna be more people coming there more people wanting to get involved in the scene more parties more club nights it's some it's great like i, I don't see the problem with this the only problem that could happen is if, again, is if some of the clubs decide to kind of um, sell out and start having deals with these club promoters, right? These tour providers and start providing entry for these people. Oh, you come and you have a particular wristband. That's when it's going to get cheap. But Berlin is a bit Berlin because it has that standard, that high standard of like everyone is dem democratic, right? If you don't know anyone, you're not on the list. There is no guest list unless you're on the list. Um, you stand in the queue, you behave you dress a certain way, you act a certain way on the dance floor, you conduct yourself a certain way in the things that you're doing, where whatever they may be. It's all about that standard and then everything is fine. Like, when's the last time you've been to a Berlin club and seen a fight? Like, come on. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't, it doesn't happen. Even a glass on the floor. Like, it doesn't happen. People are so courteous. They go and put their glass back on the, you know, on, on the bar. They put stuff in the bin. They go to the toilet. Like, it's just amazing. So I don't think there's a way that this could be cheaper unless, literally, like I said, like, the clubs come down and start, like, selling themselves out to these stores. But I think the, the discovery tours are being quite honest. Like, you know what I mean? They're not really selling anyone any dreams. Um... Wink, Wickle says from Griezmann said um, I don't really see these concepts evolving into something damaging for the clubs it's too niche and it's always going to be called out by people from the scene uh, Boyko said the Gagan promoter is less optimistic I'm happy to confirm you that those guys will never get into Kit Kat anymore of course open to tourists but they have to act like everyone else fit in the club and respect our work and, but how will they know who they are and, what are they going to wear a t-shirt or something I don't know that's a weird thing to say no, gonna, eh, well, I get him I get it I get it you don't you, again some Berlin clubs are so they have such a privilege they have such a they have such a good reputation within the scene they've done so much work they've contributed to, they've contributed so much they've provided people with so many amazing moments that they can actually get they can legitimately get get away with saying no to certain people all year round and it not affect their bottom line they're completely fine right they have a hard group of hard loyal group of followers um of pro regulars who come in who are going to support them regardless but so i get it but you can't do that thing in london you can't you die in a minute man unfortunately because the license holders are so shit you absolutely die um of course we have to do a tourist but they have to act a certain way like everyone else we don't want the curious people we don't want curious people invading our spaceship because they have the arrogance to pay 10 times the ticket value to someone what that's a weird line to say we don't want curious people invading our spaces isn't that the whole premise of going getting involved in the electronic music scene? Just because they have the arrogance of paper. Again, I get it. I get it, man. I get it. Like I said, if I was living in there, I'll probably have the same sort of thing. If I was a couple of months, I'll have the same sort of thing. But yeah, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think in general, they're doing it the right way. The Discovery Tour seem like they're doing it the honest way. They're giving people lectures beforehand. They're telling them about the history of the music. They may be showing them zines, flyers, album covers, uh, playing them some vinyl maybe, going through their outfits. 
I think it's all good. I think it's all good. I think it's all good. Anyway, um, and also, how many times have you been to the Bergheim and you see the group of tourists going there for the first time and just you take one look at them and you're like, why do you bother coming? Why do you think that? And why did you make that assumption in your head? Because you saw what they were dressing. You saw how they're acting in the queue. You saw what they look like. It's like, why would you bother coming here? Like, you've got those fucking Kanye shutter shades on, some some silly hoodie on, socks. Like, you just look, why would you come here? You're never going to get in, innit? You, you always, you think that straight away. Like, why would you, and then, and then now somebody's trying to provide a service to stop that person being embarrassed, stop that makes them making a fool of themselves or wasting their time, and now you're annoyed by it. Like, and they and they and they're hopefully gonna kinda teach them how not to act a fool. It's all it's all a win. We all win at the end of the day. We, and then we end up with less cocks on the dance floor. Simple as that. Not cocks that way, but you know, less like dickheads basically. Anyway. Uh next on the list. Let's move on, move on in. We got that we spoke about. We spoke about the Airbnb TV show, didn't we? Yep, we did. Um, oh, you seen this? Rick Owens' dystopian uh, Parker Parker Poncho. Again, talking about club club nights in fucking Berlin. This is going to be the ultimate fucking piece for the club nights in Berlin, right? So if you go to Berlin, imagine wearing this. This is the one. This is the one. So this is a Rick Owens from Spring Summer 19, Parker Poncho. Parker Poncho, which is you know, exactly what the name says it is. It's a punch. It's a Parker that is also a Poncho. One size fits all. Um, zip on the front. Poncho on the side. It looks fucking also. I love the marrying the styling here with the with the um what were they called? Birkenstocks and Rick Owens collaboration, which are fucking awesome. I'm surprised no, no more people are wearing them, man. They're really nice. I'm not sure if they're still in stock, but they're super, super nice. I really like the look of those, actually. I'll t show you those in a minute. But yeah, this is the Parker Poncho from Rick Owens. Look how awesome it looks. Can't really complain about that, can you? Really? Look at that. Looks fucking great. I love it. Massive Parker Poncho, like, f literally, like, it's like floor length. Massive, massive funnel hood that you're, you, we all know and love. Probably, probably the best hood around, no? Probably the best hood around. It's so awesome. Really fucking awesome. I love the look of it. Not sure when it's gonna be out. Actually, let's see here. Read the article from the the Beast of the Hype. Uh, the Amatch Parker is currently available for three hundred and three thousand three hundred and twenty on Rick Owens' website. So check it out there. Really nice little Parker poncho from Rick Owens. Next on the list here, what else do we have here? We have um, Joe Parallo and Bow. We we'll skip that for now. Uh, what else do we have here? Nike ACG article, which is really cool. I really recommend you check that out. Big fan of that. I'll read, probably do that tomorrow. I'll include that in my thing tomorrow. Doing, a, I'll do a little more street Pacific one tomorrow. There's not. I mean, let's, let's check out this, this video too. Actually, there's a video here that I thought was quite interesting. It talks about the the musical director behind. My name's Dalton. Oh, let's pause this. Uh, musical director behind the Drake. Um, assassination vacation tour looks really awesome going on because I, I went i told you guys right i went to i went to the assassination vacation tour in london a few weeks back right um which is fucking awesome i really highly recommend you go and check it out um here it is oh it's it's, it's for the scorpion tour actually it's for the scorpion tour so let me check out and see what this looks like i didn't actually go to the see the scorpion tour one did i no i did not no i did not it's like this let's make the screen a bit smaller Ba, 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 ba. Let's watch this and see what he has to say. Mr. D10 show. Boom. Scorpion tour stuff, yeah? Nice. Look at him going ham. Awesome. Is it no such as vacation? It's not a scorpion. Um, I started producing, uh -huh. and he said that there was a guy in the city. We're both from Toronto. He said there was a guy in the that city that was mad, looking for um, a producer. And we met at the studio one night. And um, I played him some music, and we just started working on it. Sick. We've always been making music, and we're like brothers. And then when it was when it was time to incorporate the live music into the show, it was just what I had always done. So it's like a handshake. Look! Look how amazing that looks, though. Come on, if you're watching, this, if you're not seeing this on, on on a podcast app, I recommend you check out this video. It's on High Snobiety now. It's called "Meet the Musical Director of Drake Scorpion Tour D10." Like, honestly, 
being in being in that O2 stadium and seeing the curtains come out, I think it's when it's, it's the first tune. When the when the curtains come down and and I think Drake walks through first and the curtains come down and he's singing behind the curtain that sort of like um, semi transparent and the curtains go up again. It's completely dark and there's all these fucking f- camera phone lights around the stadium looking through uh, peak like you know these little fairy lights all over the place. It's awe inspiring and again it's just a it's a really good marker and again because I think I've heard people a lot of people mention like Joe Budden and a few other people artists say you know like. They're selling albums and there's putting people and there's putting bums on seats. They're two different things, right? Especially in the streaming era where, you know, for the most part, if you've got um autoplay enabled on your Spotify and stuff, your music is gonna get streamed. Sometimes not because, you know, your people are actually looking for your music, but because it fits in with a particular kind of sound or it meets a particular kind of algorithm need, whatever it may be, right? So it's very it's a lot easier to get, you know, a thousand plays online than it might be to fill an arena full of a thousand people, especially the ones that want to see you, right? And then when you're in that tour and you're standing around and you're looking at this amazing fucking stage design, um, you're seeing the the screens up up in front of you, you're hearing the impeccable sound system, and then you look around the stadium and you're looking at all the other people who have the exact same I don't know, exact same maybe musical taste as you or that like the same artist as you fill in the entire stadium. You're like, wow. It's like going to see the Rolling Stones and they're like super old now, right? But you're like, fuck, these guys are in their 70s and they're still able to pull in this kind of crowd. It really gives you appreciation just how big of an artist certain people are. You need to get the understanding of like, okay, there, there are absolute levels to this. Like there are levels to this. And this Drake performance was nothing, nothing different to be honest. <laughs> paper i'm the music director but officially i don't know what's happening <laughs> you just make music that's, yeah my job is really to keep the energy yeah what are they scooping it's saturated vacation it's got the same logo keep their energy high so i just my job it's like the alter ego i gotta step out do what i do you can probably ask me i'm probably up here dancing i'm probably up here singing i'm not really paying attention to it and then once i get off stage just gets up back to just I guess one of the biggest things about being a music director is really being able to uh, manage personalities and uh, quick problem solving. If there's an issue on stage, i got to be able to fix it right away without the audience knowing anything happened. And it's just really making sure the artist is comfortable musically so when they step on stage, they can execute, they're not second guessing anything. So awesome, isn't it? Such a cool show, man. He fucking smashed that stage. Line was awesome. What a great job, man! Look at that screen. Look at that. It's just fucking awesome. I hope, I hope that, I hope they release a tour DVD, man. They need to get back to the tour DVD life. Like I know, especially after the back of the Beyonce. Um, well, it's not a tour DVD, but the Homecoming documentary on on Netflix. Come on, guys. Like, let's let's record our shows. We've all got cameras. We've all got videographers following us around. Let's release a tour DVD. Let's people experience everything, man. Release it. Limit, limit the time online, buy it, and then people rip it if they want to offline. Like, come on, man. I want to see the return to tour DVDs. It'd be so cool to see, like, I don't know, Playboy Carty's recent tour and see the behind the scenes of that and get that up on... Because I know they're probably going to put that in an org DVD, but I would like to have a standalone thing. Of like you know seeing Drake's like it's again it's just, it's moments in time it'd be cool to see these moments like you know play out on, over on tour DVDs like you know even the Life of Pablo tour with um Kanye West and shit that'd be awesome in the DVD like so cool it doesn't have to be a physical DVD but you know like an actual video capturing the events and kind of documenting it all. Okay, simple setup, three keyboards, smallest keyboard. I dedicate to bass. Hmm. Middle keyboard, I dedicate to synth and any auxiliaries. Biggest keyboard, pianos, EPs. Mm. Anything that I gotta play that's warm and colorful is here. All the low end out, you'll get from here. Wow. And then I got a sample pad here. If I gotta hit samples, I can do it here, and then all my effects will be here. Wow. And I can affect all the keyboards. If I need to add reverbs, delays. That's so fucking cool, filters, isn't it? Music is the best, isn't it? No, best job in the world, man. I sample everything into the keyboard to keep the CPU as low as possible. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, but, true. Uh, I built a lot of my sounds using native. I ended up getting complete twelve last year. I built a lot of sounds with that. Built some sounds with Reactor. Wow. And then I just add effects and layers and stuff like that wow. just to keep it. Um, to my comfort level so i'm comfortable hearing what i'm playing when i'm playing 
I'll sample some sounds from the actual album. So when I'm playing it, it's, it's familiar to the crowd. And then um, just adding little effects to it and stuff like that. Just to make it my own sound. That's fucking awesome, man. That's really cool. That's an amazing setup. Amazing setup. Music is music. You know, we all make music. We enjoy the music. And it's an expression. But the biggest thing for me is the brotherhood. Brotherhood yeah. and sisterhood. Is loyalty. Mm. A lot of the people that you see backstage, even the people that you see, you know, people that have greeted you, those are friends that we've had since day one. Wow. Since you know, we were doing shows in, um, you know, clubs with 20 people and when every label was saying no. So if, if there's anything about him, it's, it's been that, that he's been true with word when he said, if it blows up the way um, we, we spoke about it and dreamt about it, he said he's going to keep the people around and he had it. And they're here, so it's... That's fucking awesome, man. And I, I love these series as well. I think with the, with, with the internet, that's one of the powerful things about the internet. Like you get a chance to, you know, especially with YouTube, essentially if you've got like a phone or a, a, a decent digital camera, you can effectively film content and upload it onto YouTube. And if you're an aspiring producer, an aspiring videographer, wherever you are, you can highlight people that are interested to you or highlight a certain person that isn't getting the light that they maybe deserve. And the person that isn't getting like there's like a D10 probably doesn't get asked for interviews as much maybe as a, a Drake would or maybe as an OVO uh, so a, a, a 40 would whatever. Um, it's a good chat. He'd be lo he'd love it to kind of get a bit of you know shine on his on his kind of life and to kind of you know speak about the things that he's going through and also what it does for the public or for the audience is that it provides another entry um into the scene right because I know some kids will kind of look at this stuff and they're oh man it's amazing go to Drake show and you're like you know you're kind of picturing yourself on that stage when really you know the stage is put sort of like you know the starting eleven of a football team right that's the that's the one percent of the one percent. But you can still be part of a football team if you're, you know, a physio, the media guy, a press agent, whatever it may be. Um, you're the one that, I don't know, prepares the fucking drinks in the morning. There's loads of really important jobs that keep that ship running that are super crucial that would kind of, you know, again, have you in and around that scene or that or that particular environment forever and ever and ever, right? You're never going to lose a job. If you're the physio of a sports club, like, you, you know, you're never going to be out of a job un until you basically retire if you want to. Same same thing with this D10 guy, right? If you're a sound engineer, if you're the producer, the technician, the musical director, as his official title is, you're never going to be without a job, even if Drake decides to hang up his um, microphone or whatever um, sometime soon. It was always somebody else that would want you to come jump on a team because usually in these kind of roles, like, it's, it's there's a very... Um, People that know what they're doing are in high demand, right? It's sort of like uh, developers in that regard, right? People that actually know what they're doing to a high level are in high, high, high demand. So you can you can command a real pretty penny if you're good at your job in that kind of level. So I'm happy we're going to see these, these series. There's, a, there's another one too I saw on YouTube that I forgot the name of that highlights producers. That's really cool. I recommend you check that out too and quite a few others as well. So again, like I said, I'm just happy for the kids. They get to see another entry point in. They don't always have to try and fucking be the person on the microphone. Like, oh, I want to be the mic guy. Like rapper or the singer. It's like, come on, man. Like this, we've got enough of those already. Like start a label, uh, start a club night, open up a bar, um, open up a, I don't know, a co-working space, a, a studio, um, be an agent, uh, do the graphic design for somebody, do the social media, uh, be the manager, whatever. There's loads of things. Maybe not managers or well, because people love doing that so they can just like, you know, pretend they're doing stuff and they take people's money. But like provide service, be of service to the scene or somebody without expecting anything and then see what happens in the future and can keep moving that way but yeah, that was a really cool series I recommend you check it out it's called uh, Meet the Musical Director of Drake's uh, Scorpion so it's not Scorpion so it should be called Assassination of Education Tour because that was a tour they were on uh, D10 really really cool uh, ba, 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 ba. there's a great arc here Fraser, Fraser Cook but I'll read it tomorrow for my streetwear thing break that down for a bit I've got to read that there's an article with Gino Gino's coming back you heard about Gino Gino's coming Gino's making a comeback brothers and sisters Gino's making a comeback He's reintroducing his brand, Poets, that if, if you're a, if you're ahead, you would have known it. It's an article here on on High Snobiety. I haven't really read the whole article, but it says here, um, founded by pro skater Gino Rinder, Gino Iannuichi, Poets is a Long Island-born clothing label inspired by his childhood passion films and sports like tennis and hockey. And if you're really familiar, back in the day, he did the Poets blazer back in the day that I had, that I saw, that I regret selling it. Navy blue, sort of black kind of colorway. Really nice blazer. But he's well known for wearing, you know, really crazy shoes, basically, um, when he's skating, whether it's soccer shoes, whether it's like indoor five-a-side shoes, 
whether it's incredibly thin plim soles like he's like he's the best but there's a common saying that you know people would prefer to see you know push them some skate skate because he has some maybe the best push style in the world uh he just looks like an absolute he just looks so graceful on a skateboard that's basically it but anyway, video continues Poets is making a comeback. So here is Gino pushing, looking amazing. Well, again, wearing soccer trainers. Again, Poets. Oh, Poets cardigan. Nice. Poets. What's that? Zip up jacket. Another Poets jack shirt there. It's a good idea he's bringing it back, though. It's really it's well needed nowadays, I think. Glad to hear it, man. Oh, we've got VCR cameras there, too. Of course, that's a fetish we're going for. We've got him playing tennis. Yeah, boy. I'm all over this. Oh, what are those trainers he's wearing actually? They actually look like what are they? Are they another another Nike indoor tennis sneaker or Tiempo or something of those likes? Or that collaboration again? Imagine coming back into a scene with your brand, reintroducing it, and you come out the gate straight out of the gate with a Nike collab. That's what you get when you're an OG. OG OG Look. Where is it? Come on. It looks good though, to be honest. Gino looks good, man. Looks like he hasn't been on the sauce or anything. Looks good. He looks, looks, looks good. He looks in good good health. Good t-shirts I like so far. I'm seeing some nice t-shirts here from Poets. I'm seeing some great jackets with Poets written on the back. I'm not a fan of the P on the shoulder because it looks a little bit like Palace and ain't no one. No one. We're not wearing Palace out here. Fuck all that shit. We're not trying to, we're not trying to uh, appropriate fucking working class culture. Wearing sweatpants with loafers and smoking cigarettes and wearing sovereign rings like a numpty. We want to wear Poets. That's, this, looks, this looks awesome. I wonder, I wonder what the sneakers are. Hmm. They're super thin as well, aren't they? I don't know what they are. They look incredibly thin, though. Going back to the you know, standard Gino in, in your Ianuichi protocol. I wish I pronounced how you pronounce his name. Ian Ianuichi? Ian Nuichi. Ian Nuichi. I don't know how you pronounce it. Certain way, anyway. But anyway, that's that's a video there. It's, it's available on High Snobiety. It's an article called Skater Gino Nui in Ian Nuichi Writes the Next Chapter of His Brand Poets. Check it out. Check it out. Um, hi, that. It's an hour. It's an hour already. It's an hour. It's zip by, zip by. There's loads of other things I need to talk about. But again, I'm going to I'm gonna add this all to, to a list of my stuff for the Streetwear Pod. Streetwear Pacific Pacific Podcast is going to do, do again tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you for tuning into Excellence Zinger Show, episode number 185. It's been a pleasure to have you as in my company. As always, everything concerning me, check out my website below, excellencezinger.com. I'll be DJing tonight at the White uh, sorry, White Post, at the Tap East in Westfield, Stratford for my night called Tapped. If you're in the area, come and check that out. Uh, Westfield Stratford today 7 p.m. until 11 p.m. Um, tomorrow I'm probably chilling out tonight I'm probably gonna go out for a little boogie somewhere in East so if you're around and see me say hi bye boom um, apart actually I might go to the yard actually for the night called Inferno so if you're around there check me out I might be on the dance floor throwing shapes um, apart from that thank you so much for tuning in I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode but until then take care of yours and mine and I'll see you again later bye